Hello everyone, it's Miss Manili, um, and I'm going to go ahead through the lesson on introducing you to two special types of random variables called the binomial and the geometric random variable. Both of these random variables are discrete, meaning that they have distinct outcomes that you can count. Um, so we're going to go through some characteristics of these two um, special cases and then talk about how to calculate some probabilities. So really, um, the only kind of random variables that we've we've talked about so far, we've been given a probability distribution. Um, or, for example, with a continuous random variable of the normal distribution, we already know characteristics about the normal curve and we're able to calculate probabilities using our calculator. The binomial and the geometric are just special situations that allow us to use other formulas similar to like what we did with the normal. Um, well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, so after after this lesson, um, you should be able to determine what conditions are required and when a setting um, describes either a binomial or a geometric random variable, or maybe it's neither. You'll also be able to compute and interpret probabilities involving a binomial and geometric distribution using probability formulas. Okay, so let's think back to um, a simulation that we did a while ago where um, you guys were tossing die and it had to do with um, a soda contest where if you, re if you opened the soda bottle and looked under the cap, you had a chance of winning a free soda. And the company claimed that one in six soda cans um, were winners. And we had a situation where there were seven friends that went into a convenience store and bought a soda and three of them won. And since the money was coming out of the convenience store owner's pocket, he was concerned that perhaps this one in six wins claim wasn't true. And I told you that, you know, we did this using simulation to determine whether or not it was reasonable um, for there to be three winners in a group of seven. Um, but we're going to look at this now from a total probability perspective, and we're going to look at this um, using theoretical probability. Um, and so if you think about the situation, there were essentially two outcomes. Either you won a free soda or you didn't. Um, there were a fixed number of observations. In this case, we had seven friends that went into the convenience store. We can assume that each of the friends wins independently of the others. And we can also assume that the probability of winning is the same for each person because each of the bottles is different. Um, in a situation where all four of these conditions are met, this is called a binomial setting. And it's actually um, a very... Um, popular setting, I guess, or, or something that happens naturally quite, quite frequently. So a binomial setting arises when we perform several independent trials of the same chance process and record the number of times that the part particular outcome occurs. Um, and four conditions do have to be met. Um, but just to kind of give you some understanding, um, if you think about like if you have a dozen eggs and I'm counting the number of eggs in the dozen that could be cracked, or if I'm looking at a case of soda and I'm wondering how many broken bottles are in the case, or if I've got a classroom full of students and I'm wondering the number of students in the class that are wearing glasses, um, those, those could all possibly fit a binomial setting if some of these conditions are met, or if all of these conditions are met, in fact. Um, the, the first thing you want to think about is, uh, is it possible to frame the situation in such a way so that um, regardless of how many events or outcomes there are, can I categorize them as success and failure? If I have just like one outcome of, that I'm interested in, then I would call that success. Everything else would be considered a failure. So if I'm playing a game involving dice, you know, obviously there are six sides to every die, but if I'm only interested in tossing a six, the six becomes the success and all of the other outcomes become failure. So that can be constructed into to a binomial setting if I look at it that way. Um, the other criteria are that the probability of success has to be the same for each observation. So if I'm tossing a number or a, a, a die, the probability of landing on six every time is going to be the same. Um, I also have to have independent observations, and that would be true with tossing a die as well. There also has to be a fixed, fixed number of observations. So if I said, all right, I'm going to toss this die 10 times, and I want to see how many times I get 6, then that would absolutely fall into a binomial scenario, because there's a fixed number of observations. They're all independent. The probability of tossing a 6 is the same for each one. And since I'm only interested in tossing a 6, that's my success. All of the other outcomes are failures. So I can look at this as a binomial setting. And what we're interested in with a binomial random variable is the number of successes, and we use the letter K to represent the number of successes. Sometimes you'll see it written as an R, but in our book I think um, it's pretty common to just refer to it with a K. So the number of successes K in N trials, so N refers to the number of trials. If X is a random variable that is binomial with a probability of success P and a fixed number of N trials, then the notation that we use 
and you might recognize this from the normal distribution, is to say that x is distributed binomially and then we list the parameters. And in this course, if it helps, just to remember that the parameters are always listed alphabetically. So with the normal distribution, we have the mean and then the standard deviation. With the binomial, we have n and then p. Um, and so x is distributed binomially, and that would be the shorthand way of expressing how a variable is distributed. But there are other types of settings. Um, another type that is very similar to the binomial is the geometric setting. So let's consider instead, we'll still talk about that one in six wins contest, but in this case, instead of having seven people walk into a store and count the number of winners, what about if I keep buying soda until I win? In that situation, I'm going to stop as soon as I get a winner. Um, and this falls into what we call the geometric setting. In a situation such as this, the goal is to repeat the chance behavior until a success occurs. And these situations are called geometric. So a geometric setting arises when we perform independent trials of the same chance process and record the number of trials it takes to get one success. And then we stop. On each trial, the probability of success must be the same. So that most of these, um, in fact, all of the um, conditions for the geometric setting are the same as the binomial. There's just one additional condition for the binomial distribution. So just like before, all the observations have to be able to fall into two categories, either success or failure. And success doesn't necessarily have to be a good thing. Um, if I'm looking at patients in a waiting room and I'm looking at patients until I find one who is sick, um, then obviously being sick isn't doesn't seem to be what I would normally consider a success. But if I'm just categorizing the observation of interest and calling that a success, it doesn't ha necessarily have to be a good thing. Failure doesn't have to be a bad thing either. Um, the probability of success has to be the same for each observation, and the observations all have to be independent. So these conditions are the same as for the binomial. Um, the variable of interest now, though, since I don't have a fixed number of outcomes, it's counting the number of trials that are required to obtain the first success. So um, if I am a telemarketer, it might be the number of people I have to call before someone doesn't hang up on me. Um, or it could be um, the number of attempts I make at playing basketball. If I'm playing basketball and I'm just trying to shoot and make a basket, it could be the number of attempts it takes for me to make a basket. Or maybe I'm guessing on a test and I'm, it's the number of questions that I have to guess on before I get one right. The number of lottery tickets that I buy until I become a winner. Those would all fall into the geometric setting. Okay, so your first set of examples are a bunch of different scenarios, and what you're asked to do is to consider each one, think about all of the requirements, and, and remember, like, for each of them, you need to have a constant probability of success. You must have independence. Independence. And you must have, be able to classify your outcomes as success or failure. If it's going to be binomial, you also have to have a fixed number of observations. And so what I'd like you to do is um, pause the video for a minute, and I'd like you to look through each of these scenarios and determine whether or not it could be considered a binomial or geometric distribution. And if not, just say neither. Um, but make sure you explain why. If it is binomial or if it is geometric, then state the parameters. So with a binomial distribution, our our uh, parameters would be n and p um, with a geometric and I don't think I really emphasize this so let me go back um, with a geometric random variable the notation that we use is y is distributed geometrically the only parameter is the p is the probability of success because we no longer have a fixed number of outcomes um, the other thing I want to point out is with a binomial random variable if I'm looking at the number of successes in n trials, it's possible that I don't have any. So the lowest value that a binomial random variable can take on is zero, and the highest would be whatever my value of n is, whatever the number of trials are. With the geometric, it's different. If I am, you know, repeating um, a trial until I have a success, there's no way for me to have zero successes. So the value of my random variable has to start at one, and it actually is infinite. Uh, I mean, it, in, in practice, we'd stop, but in theory, it wouldn't because it's possible to just keep tossing a coin and never, never, ever landing on heads. Um, um, and so even though it is 
indefinite. Um, it is still geometric, is still considered a discrete random variable. Okay, so again, what I'd like you to do is to pause the video for a minute and to go through these examples and see if you can identify which ones are geometric, which ones are binomial, and which ones are neither. And again, if, if it's neither, tell me why. Um, and if it is binomial or geometric, tell me what the parameters are. So please go ahead and pause the video at this time. Okay. Um, so for the first one, it says blood type is inherited. If both parents carry genes for the O and A blood types, each child has a probability of 25% of having type O blood. Suppose a couple has five children with each child inheriting independently of the others. Define the random variable X to be the number of children with type O blood. So in this case, we're identifying a success as having type O, so a failure would be any of the other blood types. It doesn't matter that there are multiple types. Um, our probability of success is given to us as 0.25, and we're told that the the ch children inherit their blood types independently of each other, and we know that there are going to be five children. So this um, random variable, and I can go ahead and say it's x since it's defined, is distributed binomially. Um, and notice that I just use the letter b, just like we did with a normal distribution. You can also just use the like the letter n for normal or b for binomial. And I always put my parameters in alphabetical order, so n and then p. In letter B, it says an experiment consists of repeatedly drawing cards without replacement from a deck of 52 cards until an ace is drawn. So on the surface, this looks like it could possibly be a geometric random variable because we're going to continue with a process until we have a success, where a success in this case would be an ace. But this without replacement causes a problem for us because if I don't put the cards back in the deck, I don't have independence anymore. The probability of me getting an ace is going to change if I don't replace the cards every time I draw. So because the probability isn't constant and because without replacement I no longer have independence, this technically is neither. Now if I did put the cards back in the deck and shuffle them, it would be considered a geometric um, distribution and the probability of success would be 4 out of 52 because that's how many aces there are in the deck. In letter C, it says, in basketball, attempt a three-point shot until a basket is made. We have to make some assumptions here because there isn't any other information in the problem. I don't know the probability of making the basket, so I'll have to assume not only is that known, but that it's constant. I would also have to assume independence, which in practice really may not be the case. If I'm, you know, trying to make a three-point shot over and over and over again and I keep missing, I'm going to get discouraged, I'm going to get tired, I'm going to get worn out. So my attempts may not necessarily be independent. You don't have to worry about that with a problem like this. If you write assume independence and a constant probability of success, um, in this case, that's a reasonable assumption to make. Sometimes it's not reasonable, so you do have to be careful. Um, but in a situation like this, you would still get it right if you were to say that this could be a geometric distribution, although we don't know the probability of success. All right, and letter D, deal 10 cards from a shuffle deck one at a time, again without replacement, and Y represents the number of red cards you observe. Again, that not replacement causes a problem for us because it means in a deck of cards that I don't have independence because the probability of drawing another ace is going to depend on whether or not I've already drawn an ace. Um, or a red card, I'm sorry, and um, the probability is not going to be constant if I remove cards from the deck. So technically this is neither. Now if I did put the cards back in the deck and I did shuffle them, this would be a binomial situation. And since the probability of getting a red card is 50%, my probability distribution would, my n value would be 10 and my p value would be 0.5. But again, since I'm not putting the cards back, it's not binomial. Let's take a look at letter E, because I put a little star by, by this saying this is a special case. An engineer chooses a simple random sample of 10 switches from a shipment of 10,000 switches. Suppose that unknown to the engineer, 10% of the switches in the shipment are bad. The engineer counts the number X of bad switches in the sample. So on the surface, this is really similar to the deck of cards, right? I'm pulling 10 cards from a deck and I'm not replacing them, and so therefore I don't have independence, my probability isn't constant, so it's not binomial. But think about this, if I have 10,000 switches in a, in a truck or a shipment and I'm only picking out 10, is the probability of drawing a bad ship, chip really changing if I don't put that one chip back, if there's 10,000 switches left? If, if you think about the difference between 1 out of 10,000 
and 1 out of 9,999, the difference is so small that we can actually say in this case that it is approximately binomial. Um, so this is a special case when the population, and actually I have this written down, when the population is much, much, much larger than the sample then sampling without replacement isn't a problem. And we can still assume independence, and we can also assume that the probability remains constant, even though technically it doesn't. Um, I'll give you another example. So I don't know if this is still true, but years and years and years ago, um, in California, it is illegal to bet with dice. I don't know why. So um, gambling on Indian reservations is legal, and other parts may be legal now. But this is like, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago that I went. And I went on an Indian reservation, and my boyfriend and I at the time were playing craps. And if you think about a craps game, you play with dice. And it's where you shoot the dice across the table, and you don't want to get a seven. Um, well, at this particular casino, they were playing with cards. Um, and they had like... I don't know, hundreds of decks of cards that were all shuffled together. And they were only using um, the, the cards. Um, I'm trying to think of how they did it. They, I guess they only used the numbers um, 2 through um, 12. But I guess they had to have used... I forget exactly. But anyway, they were using cards. And I'm like, wait a minute, how can how can this work? Because if, if they're not putting the cards back in the deck and shuffling them. But because they had so many decks of cards um, that were used in the craps game, um, it, it's almost as if there's independence. And so if your population is much, much, much larger than your sample, and in this case, I'm looking at a shipment of 10,000 switches as opposed to 10 switches, it's OK to assume independence if I'm sampling without replacement. I mean, any time we sample, even if I'm sampling from a population to, to do a survey on people, I'm sampling without replacement. I don't want the same person to take the sample or take the survey twice. So. Otherwise, it would be fatal, and we wouldn't be able to do any kind of inference techniques. So as long as your population is l much, much larger than your sample, sampling without replacement is OK. Um, but if I'm only dealing with a deck of cards, or if I'm dealing with a small population, then I have a lack of independence. My probability of success is not constant. And so I wouldn't be able to use a binomial or a geometric distribution. OK, so let's talk about probabilities. Um, if I'm asked the question, what is the probability of having k successes in end trials? Or what is the probability of me making three baskets in 10 attempts at basketball? Um, or I could ask the question, what's the probability that the first basket I make is on the 10th attempt? Um, those two questions can an be answered. They're both binomial and geometric um, using pretty much the same process. I need to think about what the probability of success is and the number of successes. I need to know the probability of failure and the number of failures. And then I also need to consider how many different ways the outcome can occur. Um, and so for geometric, we'll start there because it's a little bit easier to figure out. So for a geometric random variable, calculating the probability that y is equal to any number is actually pretty simple. Because there's really only one way of achieving one success, um, because you're going to stop as soon as you have a success. So remember with the geometric probability, it's, it's the probability of, um, or it's the number of trials until a success. So if I'm playing, if I'm attempting free throws, I might ask, what's the probability that the first time I make a basket occurs on the sixth shot? So I'd be asking the question, what's the probability that x equals 6? So if my probability of making a basket, let's say it's 50%, well, let's, let's do it different. Let's say my probability of success in this case is 25%. Um, I'm going to keep shooting until I make a basket. So if, if I'm looking at the probability that the first basket occurs on the sixth shot, then let me just kind of label. This would be my first shot, my second, my third, my fourth, my fifth, and my sixth. So if my first success isn't happening until here, that means I failed, I failed, I failed, and failed again and failed again. And again, these are all and, so I'd be able to multiply the probabilities. You do not have to write this down. OK, so if I think about it this way, there's only one way this can happen. I can't have my first success happen on the sixth try any other way than this. Well, if I know the probability of success is 0.25, then I know the probability of failure 
and what we call that is 1 minus p, this is just the complement, is going to be 0.75. So that means I'm looking at 0.75 times 0.75, dot, dot, dot. I'm basically doing that five times. And so basically what we do is we use exponent notation to represent that. So my formula that you see then, this 1 minus p is your probability of failure. This up here, this k minus 1, is your number of failures. And it's always one less than whatever this number is. Because if I make my first success on my sixth shot, that meant that the first five shots were failures. And then my p is just the probability of success. And there's only one success, so I don't need to worry about raising that to a power. So that's your formula for computing a geometric probability. So let's take a look at an example. In the board game Monopoly, one way to get out of jail is to roll doubles. Suppose that this is the only way a player could get out of jail. Let the random variable of interest, let's call it y, be the number of attempts it takes to roll doubles one time. So we need to describe the probability distribution of y using proper notation. So since we're looking at the number of attempts it takes to roll doubles, I can see that I'm talking about a geometric setting. I know that I've got independence here, right, because I'm tossing die. So that condition is met. Success in this case would be tossing doubles. We've got to figure out, though, what the probability of success is. So if you think about it, um, if I'm tossing two dice, there are six outcome on the first die, six outcome on the second die. So there are 36 outcomes total. So how many ways can I get doubles? Well, I can get a 1 and a 1, a 2 and a 2, a 3 and a 3, a 4 and a 4, a 5 and a 5, or 6 and a 6. That's six different outcomes. So my probability of success is going to be 6 out of 36, or 1 6. And I will recommend that in, in these types of problems, when you're looking at a probability of success, it's better to leave it as a fraction, because you're going to be using that, that number over and over and over again. So if you have a rounding error, and you're raising that error to some power, note that you're going to be way off in your answer. So if, if something like 1 sixth or 1 third, it's better to leave it as a fraction than it is um, to round in your formulas. So I, all the conditions are met for a geometric random variable. My random variable is already defined for me here. So I can say that y is geometric, and the only parameter I need is my probability of success, which is 1 sixth. So now the question is, how could you determine the probability that it takes three turns to roll doubles? So that means I'm getting doubles for the first time on the third try. So I'm looking at the probability that y is equal to 3. The only way that can happen is if I have two failures. So I'm going to have a failure times another failure times a success. And I guess I should refer this as p, p. Okay, so if I have two failures, if I think about the probability of failure must be 5 sixths. So there's my 1 minus p. I had two of them, so I'm going to raise that to the second power, times my probability of success, which is 1 sixth. And if you multiply that all the way out, you get 0.1157. So geometric probabilities are actually pretty easy. Binomial probabilities are a little bit harder. Um, we're going to do this by hand just for this lesson, and then I'm going to show you how to calculate your probabilities using the calculator like we did with the normal distribution. Um, but it is important that you understand the formulas, because sometimes you get questions on the AP exam that relate to the formulas. Um, the formulas will be given to you on the AP exam, so you don't have to memorize them, but you do need to understand all the different components. Um, Okay, so to understand the binomial probability formula, we're going to work through an example. So determining binomial probabilities requires, like I said, a little bit more work, since there may be multiple ways of achieving k successes in so many trials. Um, so let's take a look at number three. Suppose you're taking a timed final exam. You have three multiple, qu multiple choice questions left to do, so that's important. Each question has four answer choices, and only one is correct. You have five seconds left, so you randomly select the answers without even reading the questions. What is the probability that you get 0, 1, 2, or all three questions correct? Is this a binomial setting? If so, define n and p. So if it's binomial, we have to know what success is. 
So in this case, a success, if I'm interested in getting something correct, the success is going to be getting a correct answer. I need to know the probability of success. So it says that, um, let's see, there are four answer choices and only one is correct. So my probability of success is going to be one-fourth. In this case, because one-fourth divides nicely into 0.25, you can use a, you can use a decimal. Um, I need to have a fixed number of outcomes. In this case, I've got three questions left, so I know n is three, and I need them to be independent. The fact that um, we're told that we're just randomly selecting the answers, I can assume independence here. We're not reading the questions. We're not learning anything as we go. We're remembering anything. So we can assume independence. So in this case, we do have a random variable that is binomial. Um, and so what we'll want to do is define it. So let's say x equals the number of correct answers. Then I can say that x is binomial. And the parameters, again, are in alphabetical order. n is 3, and p is 0.25. In letter B, it says to use the multiplication rule to determine the number of combinations of correct and incorrect responses. I've got three questions left. There are only two outcomes. It's either right or wrong. So if I think about it, my first question, there's two outcomes. My second question, there's two outcomes. And my third question, there's two outcomes. Two times two times two is eight. So there's eight possible ways that I can answer these questions. So the next thing we want to do, and we've done something like this. We did this in the very beginning when we first started talking about probability. I think we did it with di over with uh, coins, heads and tails. So in this case, we're talking about getting a correct or an incorrect response on a test. And I want to list all the possible outcomes. So we said there's eight of them. So if you remember, I showed you a strategy for being able to list all of the outcomes without losing any. So if there's eight possible outcomes, I can look at the first four being correct and the in terms of my first question, um, the first four being correct or success, and then the other four would have to be wrong. And then I'm going to break it in half. So if I have four successes on the first question, I've got to break these in half because on the second question, the first half are going to be success and the second will be failure. And then success, success, failure, failure. And on the last one, I'm just going to do every other. Success, failure, success, failure, success, failure, success, failure. And we said the probability of success is 0.25. So the probability of failure is going to be 0.75. I'm actually going to go ahead and um, complete this third column. So if I had success, 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 and I am defining the number of correct responses as my random variable, then in this case, x is equal to 3. For the next outcome, I'd say that x is equal to 2. And the next one, it would also be 2. The next one would be 1. We'd go back to having two successes, 1, 1, and then the last one is all failures. So we'd have zero successes. So you can see there are multiple ways to have two successes. There are multiple ways of having one success. We did not have that issue when I was dealing with a, ge a geometric probability situation because there was only one way that I could experience my success on the last trial. There's only one way that can happen. But with a binomial, I have to consider all of the different ways of having two successes or one success. So now let's talk about how to calculate the probabilities. Remember we said we had independence. So if I'm trying to find the probability of success and success and success, that's the same thing as doing the probability of success times the probability of success times the probability of success, which is going to be 0.25. And since I have three successes, I'm going to raise that to the zero power. I mean, I don't know why I did that. I want to raise that to the third power. To get us in the habit of understanding the formula, I'm also going to include my probability of failure. And how many failures did I have? None. Let's take a look at the next one. I had two successes and one failure. So this time, my formula is simply going to be 0.25 squared times 0.75 to the first power, because I only had one failure. I'm going to go ahead and finish filling in this, in this uh, table. The next one also had two successes, 0.25 squared 
times 0.75 to the first power. The next outcome I only had one success, so that's going to be 0.25 to the first power. This time I had two failures, so that's going to square my 0.75. And in this last one, I had no successes. But notice, I'm going to keep my 0.25. I'm just going to raise it to the zero power because I had zero successes. Since everything was a failure, I'm going to have 0.75 raised to the third power. So I think you can start to see how my formula is being developed. When I now take this table and create a probability distribution for x, I've got to think about the possible values of x. The lowest number of correct responses I can get is zero. The most I can have is three. So I have 1 and 2 in the middle. Get that out of the way a little bit. OK. So now what I want to do is complete the probability distribution. I can't simply just multiply the number of successes times the number of failures, or the probability of success times the probability of failure, because there are multiple ways that I could have successes and failures. So in this first one, the probability that x equals 0, you'll see that that really does only occur one time. And so I'm going to include that one time, and then my probability, 0.25 to the 0 times 0.75 to the third. And I'll, let's see, that ends up being 0.4219, and I rounded. If I'm looking at the probability that x equals 1, I've got to recognize that there are three ways that that happened. So I've got to take that into consideration. And then I'm going to have one success. So I'm going to have my probability of success to the first power. If I had one success, that means I had two failures. So I'm going to take my probability of failure and raise that to the second power. And the next one, I'm looking at the prob um, probability of getting two correct. So notice again, there's three ways that can happen. I'm going to multiply times my probability of correct. And I'm going to raise that to the number of correct answers, which would have been 2. And then I'm going to multiply that by my probability of failure and raise that to the number of failures, which would be 1. And then finally, again, now with the all three correct, there's only one way that can happen. I'm going to take my probability of success and raise it to the number of successes, which in this case is 3, times the probability of failure and raise that to the number of failures. And so if you actually multiply this all out, and then the last one is 0 0.0156. Now there are some rounding, obviously, that I had to do to get these numbers. So if you were to add them up the way they're written, you might find that they don't add up to 1 exactly. They might add up to 0 0.999 or 0 0.998. Um, or maybe it's a slightly over one, depending on how we round it. And that's okay. That's expected sometimes when you round your answers. Um, some people may notice that these two probabilities happen to be the same. That's just a coincidence. Um, so don't worry about it. And that's simply because um, if you look at this particular probability, 3 times 0.25 is going to give us 0.75 which is equivalent to this 0.75 to the third power. So that's just a coincidence that those first two probabilities are the same. So you might be thinking, holy cow, am I going to have to create this table every single time I want to answer a probability question? And the answer is no. We simplify this formula basically doing what we did down here. And so if you turn the page, um, the um, binomial probability formula um, kind of simplifies things in some ways. It's still kind of complicated. But um, basically, we're looking at the probability that x equals some number k. And, and again, k represents the number of successes. I've got to take the number of ways that outcome can occur. I've got to multiply it by my probability of success. And I'm going to have to think. I'm going to have k successes, so I'm going to have to multiply my probability of success that many times or raise it to the k power. I'm going to have my probability of failure, and then I've also got to take into consideration the number of failures. So this is number of failures. This number here is my number of successes. 
Probability of success, if you remember, we define that as P. Probability of failure, we define that as 1 minus P. This is something you haven't seen before. This is a very special quantity, this figuring out the number of ways to have K successes and N outcomes. This is what we call the binomial coefficient. And I think this is probably the most mathy it's going to get. The binomial coefficient, the formula for figuring out the number of successes or the number of ways to have K successes in N trials. So this is how the formula breaks down. This is something that I'm assuming most of you have never seen before. The P again, this is your probability of success. The K is your number of successes. The 1 minus P, that's your probability of failure. And this quantity here is going to be the number of failures. This awesome expression here is what we call the binomial coefficient. And the way we say this, because it's not a fraction, we say this is N choose K. That's what that expression means. And it's a combination. You may have learned about combinations and permutations in like seventh grade. This is a combination. We want to know the number of possible combinations of having K successes in N trials. And there's a formula for this. This is the formula. N choose K. Now it becomes a fraction. This is N factorial. Some of you may know what a factorial is. And this would be K factorial times N minus K factorial. And again, this is the number of successes factorial times the number of failures factorial. And so what I mean by factorial isn't N. I'm not shouting. It's not like we're not getting excited about N. What a factorial means is I'm, it's basically multiplication. So it's easier, I think, if I just show you a number. So like 10 factorial is going to be 10 times 9 times 8 times 7 times 6 times 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1. And that would be a real pain in the butt to do on your calculator to multiply it out. So lucky for us, there's actually a command on your calculator that will do that. Um, in fact, let me pull it up. So if you wanted to do 10 factorial, I would just type in my 10 and then go to your math button and ooh, all the way over to the PRB. And actually, if you use the back arrow, you can get there a little bit faster. Option 4 is your factorial command. So 10 factorial is going to be that huge number. You definitely don't want to multiply this out on your home screen. Okay, and so that's how we would determine the number of ways to have K successes in N trials. So let's go ahead and take a look at an example. Okay, so Miss Manili makes about one third of her free throw attempts. That is a completely false statement, but let's just pretend it's true. Um, so how many ways can I make six baskets out of 10 attempts? So what that looks like mathematically, so six baskets, those would be my number of attempts. That would be my K. 10, I'm sorry, um, six, that would be my number of successes. 10 attempts would be my number of trials. So this would be my N. So what I'm trying to figure out is what is N choose K, or in this case, 10 choose 6. The bigger number is going to go on top. So according to the formula, that means I'm going to do the 10 factorial on top. The number of successes is six, that's going to go on the bottom. And then if I make six baskets, that means I had four failures. So that is the quantity I am going to try to figure out. So again, on my calculator, oops, I didn't mean to do that. On my calculator, um, and you can do this all in one step. I already figured out 10 factorial, that was a coincidence. But if you want to do it all in one step, again, you just do 10 math, go back to get that factorial. And then when you do your division, you want to make sure everything else is in parentheses so you can do it all in one shot. 
So then I'm going to put in parentheses, I need to do 6 factorial, so 6, math, back up, and then times 4 factorial. And even though we know 10 factorial is some humongous number, it actually reduces to 210. And let's think about why that would be, right? 10 factorial is going to be 10, oops, 10 times 9 times 8 times 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. 6 factorial is 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. 4 factorial. So a bunch of these numbers are going to cancel. So I'm really not left with whatever 10 factorial was. That was a huge number. That's why it ends up reducing to something pretty reasonable. Um, another option is to use your um, NCR command. So you can see on your calculator, the calculator uses the letter R instead of the letter K, and that's also a popular um, um, variable that's used in other statistics books as well. So again, these two commands here, this would be the number of permutations, and this is when um, order matters. We don't really do anything with permutations in this course. Number of combinations is what we're interested in. Okay, and so the other option, if I'm doing n, if I'm doing 10 choose 6, instead of doing n choose k this way, I can look at it as n choose k this way, which is going to be 10 choose 6. And if you want to use the command on your calculator, you do have to type the n in first. So if I want to use this command on my calculator, I have to type in the 10 first, then go into math, again, go back to your probability screen, and you'll notice it's option 3 and then type in the 6 and you'll get the same answer. And that again is your binomial coefficient. All that tells you is the number of ways that I can make 6 baskets if you give me 10 attempts. Because I could make the first 6 and miss the next 4. I could, miss, I could make the first 3, miss 1, and then make the next 3, and then miss the other. I could make the first 4, miss 1, and get the next 2. So there are 210 ways that this can happen. And you do not want to create a table like we did in the last example where you're listing all the possible combinations. So if I want to now know the probability of making 6 baskets out of 10, now I've got to put it all together. The probability now of x equals 6 and again, we said that x is distributed binomially. n in this case is 10. I guess we didn't really say this, did we? Um, so n in this case is 10, because that's how many baskets I'm attempting. The probability of success in this case is 1 third. And again, I'm going to leave it as a fraction, uh, because I don't want to have a rounding error. And so the probability of success, so let me write this out in a formula. So the first thing I'd need is the number of ways this can happen. So we said that would be 10 choose 6. And then I've got my probability of success, which is 1 third, raised to the number of successes. And again, that's going to be 6. And then I need to multiply by that by the number of failures, or the probability of failure, which would be 2 thirds, and raise that to the number of failures. Well, if I had 6 successes and I made 10 attempts, that means there were 4 failures. Well, we already figured out the first part of this formula. I already know that that, no, that coefficient is 210. So now I can just multiply 1 third and raise that to the 6th power. Oops. I hate when this calculator does that. And then we've got 2 thirds that we want to raise to the 4th power. And the chances of me doing that are a little bit more than 5%. Okay, um, there's one more example. I'd kind of like you guys to go ahead and try that on your own. So please go ahead and press pause and attempt to number five. And I will say um, there is a little bit of a surprise in letter C. So see if you can figure it out. But please press pause. Okay, 
Um, so we have the situation where we've got Maria. I don't know what's happening to my screen. It looks like it's disappearing on me. Okay, so Maria is doing a study on the issue of the quarter system versus the semester system. To obtain faculty input, she, email, or she mails out questionnaires to the faculty. The probability that a faculty member returns the completed questionnaire is 65%. Five faculty members chosen at random from the foreign language department are sent questionnaires. We're going to let X represent the number of questionnaires returned. In this case, X would be a binomial random variable, so we're assuming there's independence among the faculty members. They're not all conspiring not to turn the survey in. Um, and so our n value is 5 and our p value is 0.65. In part A, you're asked what is the probability that exactly three of the faculty members return the questionnaire. So we're looking for the probability that x equals 3. Again, we're going to use our binomial coefficient here, 5 choose 3, times the probability of success raised to the number of successes times the probability of failure raised to the number of failures. And if you perform this calculation, you should get a little bit over 33%. In part B, the probability that only one of the five faculty members returns the questionnaire, that's the probability that x equals 1. It's going to be 5, choose 1. And you'll notice that that only can happen five different ways. I'm going to multiply by my probability of success raised to the number of successes, again that's 1, times the probability of failure raised to the number of failures, which in this case would be 4. And when you multiply that all the way out, you get 0 0.0488. The last question is a little bit different. What's the probability that the third faculty member selected is the first to return the questionnaire? This now shifts to a geometric distribution. I'm going to redefine a random variable because I don't want to use x anymore because I'm looking at it differently. I'm going to use the random variable y to represent the number of members selected until one is returned, until one of the questionnaires is returned. y would be a geometric random variable with a probability of success of 0.65. And I'm looking for the probability that y is equal to 3. Remember with the geometric distribution or geometric probabilities, you don't have to worry about that coefficient. You don't have to worry about how many different ways this can happen. It can only happen one way. And that, the only way for it to happen is if I had two failures, so I'm going to take the probability of failure raised to the second power times my probability of success. And when you multiply it out, you get almost 8%. So that's all I needed you guys to do tonight is just to kind of watch this video and take some notes and be ready. Um, in class, we will talk about how to actually use your um, distribution. If you, if you remember going to the distribution menu on your calculator where we were looking at normal CDF um, or inverse normal, we can also do that with the binomial and geometric distributions. But it's a little bit different because these are discrete and not continuous. So uh, if you have any questions, obviously bring them to class tomorrow and we will go over everything.